2022 Longmont City Council regular session to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Don? Mayor Peck? Here. Council Member Doggle Here. Council Member Martin? Oh, she isn't here. There she is. I didn't hear her. I didn't either. Can you make her a co host? She just tested, I thought. Marcia, yeah, you're Council on Member here. Martin, are you having issues uh, unmuting? You should. Yeah, you do have co-host permissions. You should be able yeah, to. Yeah, and I'm asking her to unmute. On test, she worked. It worked okay. There she is. Yeah, I thought I was unmuting, but apparently not. I Perfect. am here. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thank you. That was a good test. Council Member Waters. Here. Council Member Yarbrough. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. Let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag. So just as a reminder to the public, uh, this meeting can be viewed at the live stream at www.longmontcolorado.gov and also on our YouTube channel. Anyone uh, wishing to speak at first call and public invited to be heard will need to add his or her name to the list that, uh, in the council chambers. Only those on the list will be invited to speak at the first public invited to be heard. Speakers who do not place their names on the list will have the opportunity to speak during public hearing items this evening or at the final call public invited to be heard on any item at the end of the meeting. Um, can I have a motion to approve the June 28th minutes? So moved. So it's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, seconded by Councillor Yarbrough. Let's vote. Great. So that carries unanimously. Thank you. Are there any agenda revisions, Don? There are not, Mayor. Thank you. Um, are there any motions from the city councilors to direct city manager uh, to add agenda items to future agendas? Councilor Hidalgo Ferry. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, this is more just maybe this could be something that's added to um, our. Um, city manager update. Um, I'm just curious to know, you know, after the 4th of July, you know, I'm still getting emails from people who were um, saying that there were a lot of um, illegal fireworks. I know we do have some, everything that's housed in the, um, in those tents, those are all legal. They don't sell um, fireworks that are illegal in our, um, in our state or in our vicinity. So, you know, I don't know if these were ones that were just noisy coming from the tent or um, ones that they picked up from Wyoming or out of state and brought them in. But I would just, you know, in the future, or if you have the information now, just to um, get an update on what, um, you know, how, how did the, the call center work? How did, you know, was it, did it run well? Did, <laughs> are there any changes that we need to be looking at? Considering? Sandy, can, uh, I don't, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, Sandy can talk through some of the numbers, and I know Zach's in the back as well. Um, and I would also say that as part of what they do, um, so what's sold in the tents are supposed to be legal fireworks. Um, they did run into a situation this year. The state was doing inspections, and um, they did deal with a tent that did not have legal fireworks, and those fireworks were confiscated. And so... Um, Public Safety Chief Artis informed me of that and uh, sent me a picture of one of our assistant chiefs with the back of his truck full of those. And, and the, the state will be dealing with those issues, and I've asked Zach to make sure in terms of permitting for next year. So I, I wanted to say that because mm -hmm. there are multiple things that people are looking at in that process. But Sandy, you, you can talk about the numbers, and I don't know where Zach is. 
Yeah, in case you need it. Thanks, Mayor Peck, uh, Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Um, I, I sent a little bit of this information out this last week, but essentially in comparison to last year, we had a few more calls than we did last year during that same period of time. So last year we had 470 calls to 911. Um, this year, however, with the hotline and the online reporting, although we had more contact from folks, we only had 193 calls to 911. So certainly the hotline and the online reporting did exactly what we were hoping it would do, which is to take those off of 911 priority calls. Um, so that's really good news. Um, as far as changes that might be made, you know, my understanding from the volunteers, and, and thank you for uh, Mayor Peck and those of you who volunteered at the hotline, that was really helpful and kind of, you know, certainly uh, appreciated by all the volunteers that were there. Uh, but I think the suggestion is that Friday night, there was only five calls, so maybe shortening the period of the hotline, that really the big night was 4th of July and maybe the night before. So the suggestion that I heard from, uh, from Robin, who helped to run the call center, was maybe shorten the hotline time. But certainly the online reporting tool helped public safety staff a bunch is what I understood. There were 259 reports on the online report on the, on the fireworks line and then 271 calls to the hotline, most of those on July 4th. So um, there were a few priority one calls. There was a lot of priority one calls actually. So this did, did help for folks to be able to get to those and there were a few fires in addition. Um, and then plus the 400 pounds of fireworks that Harold was just talking about. You want to add anything, Chief Artist? Mayor Peck, oh, I heard just cut it off. There we go. Mayor Peck, Council, Zach Artist, Public Safety Chief for Logmont. Um, I will tell you, I did come out this year. This is my first year being here for Fourth of July. I did come out and had the opportunity to work both Saturday night, uh, Sunday night, and Monday. I did answer a lot of the calls that came through um, in our call center, picking up those calls, getting through the neighborhoods, trying to identify folks that were discharging fireworks and then determining whether or not those fireworks were legal or illegal. Um, so there were several warnings that were issued to quite a few of those. I don't have those numbers in front of me. Um, I think the call center went very well. One of the goals was to get the, get the calls off of our dispatch center, uh, which we were able to do, but then also get the information out pretty much real time on the heat map. So what we're doing right now is we're going through that information. Uh, ETS is helping us uh, with the back of the house stuff with addresses. Uh, beginning to look to see if we can identify what we call hot spots, meaning did we get a majority of calls in certain areas of the city? And if we did, what can we do moving forward leading up to next year before July 4th as far as trying to educate or at least getting some more uh, educational material or information out to those communities or those HOAs to try to help with that, um, educating folks, and then again, looking at what our alternatives are of what we can do uh, to try to address just ordinance-wise or whether or not enforcement-wise, what we can do a little bit better this year um, as far as how we address the illegal fireworks. Um, to your um, comment, uh, Councilmember Hidalgo, technically, yes, the tents are not supposed to sell illegal fireworks, but again, uh, we did have one up on Maine at almost at um, Highway 66 near the Walmart, um, and the state came in, they regulate those, they come in, they did a spot check, and again, determined as uh, our City Manager Dominguez said that about 400 pounds. We had to take those out and dispose of those properly at an area that we deal with our bomb disposal. Um, and so we were able to, to deal with that. But again, we're looking at, right now we're just in the gathering stage of all the intel that we got in and seeing what worked well, what we need to change. Um, we do know that there were, a uh, heat map was used after we closed the call center. And so again, trying to figure out how we can extend those hours or look at those things this was a unique year where the 4th of July fell on a Monday, so you really had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and a Monday. We weren't sure what to expect. Next year it should shift to a Tuesday, so we're only hoping that Mondays and Tuesday we would have potential a bigger issue for fireworks. But again, just a little bit of time. I think we'll have something for you probably within the next 30 days or so um, as we work through this data and information and bring back our ideas and suggestions to the council on how we can address this better. Great, thank right, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, okay, Councilor Yarbrough. Thank you for that information. I just have a question because <clears throat> we have been receiving emails about it. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question I have is how early are they setting up for those legal fireworks? Because I know a week prior to the 4th, I was, li I was hearing it myself in my neighborhood. So I know some of the complaints that I was getting 
um, you know, it's a whole week of hearing that and the fourth. And so is there any way we can restrict how long, uh, how early or how soon they can start selling those legal fireworks? I mean, like, you know, a few and days prior or, you know, I mean, that's the number one complaint that I've been receiving. And I know I've I heard them myself like a whole week before the fourth. Uh, to your answer, I, I don't. That's not my area of expertise. I don't issue those licenses. I would suspect that we can do anything that we want to as far as limiting the number of days or how long that you can sell <laughs> fireworks within the city limits of, of Longmont. Uh, but just be aware that, again, as we discussed through issues, a lot of the illegal fireworks are actually coming from uh, out of state mm -hmm. um, to where they're sold. But, again, you can limit those, I believe, and we'd have to look and, and if, whether or not legally we could do that. But I think we can limit when they're sold, how far out, whether it's 30 days or, or two weeks or whatever that may be that council chooses to look into. Um, but again, just be aware that other jurisdictions around us may not um, follow that also. So those fireworks coming into our community can still come up as soon as the first tent comes in, but it may not necessarily address the issue. But Longmont certainly can look at that and, and, and try to curb that as much as possible within the city limits of Longmont. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So Thank you. if I can, you know, one of the things I did want to say is, um, and, and Zach probably won't talk about this, but Zach and a lot of his, most of his leadership actually during those nights are actually out on patrol with the officers and, and as, as much to see what was going on and try to think about what we can do in the future based on, you know, when they were seen and getting these calls and what it was really like when they get there, what they see. So. Um, he and I have already had some conversations based on his experience and um, looking at some things for next year as well. The only question I have is, did this answer your question or do we need to provide more information? No, I think just having it public. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mayor. Yes. I could, Eugene May, City Attorney. I was just looking at our ordinance uh, for the permit to sell fireworks, permissible fireworks. It's specified in the ordinance June 19th to July 4th. So, so if we were to change those dates, we'd need an ordinance change. Okay. Good information. Thank you. Um, so city manager report. Uh, yes, Mayor, council. Um, I actually, that's, I'm glad I was here, Sandy. Um, I have um, Kevin Ismail with our um, Office of Emergency Management and Greg Manson um, with the National Weather Service. And... Um, Greg's here. Uh, Kevin will come up and, and talk a little bit about um, what they're going to discuss. But Greg's also here to give the city a, a designation from Great. the National Weather Service. Good evening, Mayor. Good. Members of the council. Good evening, Mayor and city members of City Council. I'm presenting uh, Greg Hansen, who is uh, the, the uh, Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service here in Boulder. Uh, over the last couple months, we've been working uh, together with the National Weather Service to get Longmont uh, Storm Ready certification, and uh, uh, we were able to accomplish that. And today, Greg is here to uh, give us our certification and uh, just kind of say a few words about what all that's about. I'm a tall guy. Mayor Peck and Council, thanks. Good evening for, for having me here. Uh, again, my name is Greg Hansen with the National Weather Service in Boulder. We serve uh, 22 counties in north central and northeast Colorado, providing weather forecasts and, and warnings to help keep the public safe. Uh, so we're here tonight to, to uh, award uh, Longmont your Storm Ready recognition. The Storm Ready program is a, a way for the National Weather Service to recognize communities, counties, uh, other organizations uh, for their good emergency management practices with respect to weather. So things like, do you have a plan? Do you have a 24-hour warning point? Do you have a way to receive warnings? Do you have a way to send warnings out? I know I'm on Kevin's email list, and you guys probably are too for, for weather alerts. So things like that. And there's, there's a lot of check boxes that we had to go through and, and you know, check off that things were done. But the important thing about this program is, is the relationship that it builds. Um, you know, we, Kevin knows our office, we know Kevin, when he called during an exercise they were doing, hey, can you do a forecast for us, and we know who he is, and yeah, we can do that for you. So it, it, it really enhances that relationship between us and the emergency management community, and then in, in turn, Longmont, 
uh, so we can provide good information and have a good back and forth. So I'm really happy to do this. This is a, a great part of my job. We've got a one road sign that we'll give you um, that says that uh, we are storm ready. And then I've got a, a, a plaque here that says uh, the National Weather Service and the Northern Colorado Storm Ready Advisory Board recognize Longmont, Colorado as a storm ready community for enhancing public safety by promoting the principles and values of the Storm Ready program and demonstrating your readiness and ability to respond to weather hazards. So congratulations, Kevin, and to Longmont, and uh, we're happy to be here. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. This is great. Is, would it be possible? Is it appropriate? Can we get a photograph with Absolutely. all of this? Absolutely. Okay. So we have a special report tonight from uh, Jessica Erickson for the LEDP quarterly presentation. Welcome, Jessica. I think we're ready. Okay, great. Good evening, Mayor Peck and council members. I am Jessica Erickson, President and CEO of Longmont Economic Development Partnership, here to give our second quarter impact report. We'll start by reminding you of the services that we provide through the contract between Longmont EDP and the City of Longmont, which includes strengthening Longmont's competitive position, marketing Longmont nationally and globally, supporting the creation and retention of quality jobs, advancing opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation, and advocating on behalf of all Longmont businesses. Our strategy, our economic development strategy, is Advanced Longmont 2.0, with goals related to talent, industry, placemaking, transportation, connectivity, and impact. Specific to the contract between Longmont EDP and the City of Longmont, the areas of focus are talent, industry, and impact. So I'll start by providing an update on our talent-related objectives. The first of those is being the marketing to and recruitment of new talent into our community to meet the needs of our existing primary industry base. We do that primarily through national marketing campaigns as well as a recently launched website that has a focus on the attraction of talent and connecting talent to career opportunities here in the city of Longmont. Through Q2 of 2022, we've had about 874 ad campaign impressions through a na national marketing campaign with over 3,000 clicks on that ad campaign. Top five, five user locations, so the top five places across the country that people are clicking on our ads from, include Los Angeles, Denver, Phoenix, Longmont, and Catonsville, Maryland, which we're looking into. Um, as I mentioned, we did launch our new website in late April of this year, and we've so far had over 4,400 unique users to that site with the most visited pages being the homepage, as well as our work style or career opportunity page, site selection services, so the place where people who are looking to relocate businesses or to identify expansion opportunities for businesses are going, and then our team page. 
Interestingly, and I think an indication of what we're doing working is that the top three search keywords that are getting people from the internet to our website or from their search engine to our website are jobs in Colorado, Colorado jobs, and then more specifically, engineering jobs and maintenance jobs. Our second objective, uh, our second talent objective is to conduct the annual workforce perception study, which will will launch on July 18th, so Monday of next week that will go out. Talent intelligence data is another objective of ours, so that's uh, gathering information and data and analyzing it to understand the talent needs of our primary industry base and of those industries that we've targeted for growth and expansion in our community. As part of our new website, we did launch a career pathways platform that gives individual job seekers the opportunity to take a career pathway assessment and connect directly to local jobs. And we have over 100 job seekers that have participated in that career pathways assessment just since late April when we launched the site. As part of our annual Elevate Longmont survey, which is our business retention and expansion survey, we included 27 talent needs assessment questions. That survey has closed. Uh, we have a little bit of data here, but we'll have a more comprehensive reporting of that data. But from, uh, from that survey, we heard from our employers that finding talent with the right skills, attracting talent to their companies, and retaining that talent were the top three employer challenges. We also have an objective to support our existing talent systems. We're fortunate here in Longmont to have strong uh, workforce development services through Workforce Boulder County, as well as Front Range Community College and St. Brain Valley School District. So we try to support and connect users to those systems as frequently as possible. And we do that throughout the year in two ways, both through direct referrals of existing companies to those resources, as well as including information about those resources in responses and RFP proposals for potential new co companies coming into Longmont. So based on all that, of the objectives that we are looking at, we uh, anticipate and are on track to meet all of those objectives uh, in 2022. Our industry objectives, the first being primary industry growth with one of the ways that we do that through the use of both local and state incentives. As we've talked about before, we do have a goal to update the city's incentive policy to better align with our values as a community and attract the type of businesses that are creating the opportunities for our residents and our workforce that uh, we desire. That work started in 2020 and was delayed as a result of all things 2020 and, and things that happened since then. Uh, we continue to be challenged with bandwidth on both sides of the organization, so both the city side and the economic development side, but we do still have a goal to get that updated in 2022. Uh, we have no new state or local incentives approved so far this year. However, we do have a couple that we anticipate coming forward in the next 60 to 90 days. Part of our primary industry growth objective is lead generation, so creating those opportunities or identifying and leveraging those opportunities for new business investment in our community. So far this year, or through Q2 of this year, we've had 21 total primary industry prospect leads that have come through our office. 13 of those came in new in the second quarter of this year. 15 of them continue to be active as of June 30th of 2022 with just over 2,500 potential net new jobs in that pipeline with an average, aver average annual wage of nearly $85,000 and a potential of nearly $280 million in capital investment in our community. A half of those uh, primary industry prospects are in our smart manufacturing industry cluster. So we continue to see a lot of activity in industri industrial and manufacturing space. And 90% of all of our prospects are within those advanced long 2.0 target industry clusters. Our next industry objective is business retention. So our ability to retain the primary industry base that we have here. We assess that through our annual Elevate Longmont survey or business retention expansion survey. That survey was sent to 217 Longmont-based primary employers between January and April of this year, closed on April 30th. We did receive 61 survey responses with a response rate of 28%. Our goal this year was 25%. We hosted three executive roundtables to add a little bit more color and qualitative data to what will turn into our annual state of industry report uh, at the end of this year. 
we did see a strong representation across all four of our primary industry sectors. We also have an objective, an industry objective, to deploy $60,000 of city-funded grants to startups. Initially, that was intended to go to startups participating in the Innovate Longmont Accelerator. We did, through feedback from our startup and entrepreneurial community, dissolve the Innovate Longmont Accelerator as of the end of April and are refocusing our efforts on realizing the manufacturing incubator that we've talked to you about before. We're in the process of convening the advisory board for that and have four individuals already committed to that. We also have physical space for that facility, thanks to our partners at H2 Manufacturing. So we do actually have people that are actively using that resource as we're getting it built up and up and running. And so we have issued one startup grant for a ramp participant, amplified space of $14,000. They are a Longmont-based uh, aerospace technology company. And so based on all that, we are on track to meet all of our industry objectives within the contract. Finally, our impact objectives, the first being to serve as the collective impact backbone support for Advanced Longmont 2.0. We do that through coordination of our steering committee and all of the working groups around the strategic initiatives of Advanced Longmont 2.0. Uh, so for one of those, we hosted a strategy alignment retreat earlier this year. And so far this year, I've hosted 48 initiative support meetings. We also have been fortunate to get funding to host diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops for each of our uh, initiative working groups as well as our steering committee. We've hosted two of those so far. We, with the assistance of the esteemed council member Martin, have uh, developed a new initiative proposal portal uh, with a community ready gu readiness guide that will be posted on our website very soon. And we've added four new Advanced Longmont 2.0 steering committee partners uh, from partner organizations across the community. Our current collective impact initiatives include accessible and affordable childcare, Prosper Longmont, which is focused on attainable housing, and River District. In the pipeline, we have Intracity Transportation System, which we're very close to. We have a mission and uh, vision for that initiative, and so we'll be proposing that very soon, and that will move over to the other side. And uh, we also anticipate leveraging collective impact to move the ramp project forward, as well as potentially a much more comprehensive innovation district surrounding that. And then finally, our no wrong door for eco ecosystem for entrepreneurs will be reconvening all of our entrepreneurial support organizations in August. We had turnover in almost every single leadership role in our entrepreneurial support organizations over the last uh, year or so. And so now that everybody's in place and leadership in those organizations, we'll be reconvening that conversation here very soon. Our next objective was the collective data dashboard, uh, which we did complete and was uh, launched in March of this year and can be viewed at advanced.longmont.org. I will mention that we've had a recent conversation with city staff about how we can do a better job of uh, collaborating and being consistent across both organizations as well as all of our partner organizations and the data that we're using and how we serve that to you so that it can be a good tool for your use as well as one of our partners. And then our final impact objective is our leadership council. So this is really about engaging the private sector in the work both the work and the funding of economic development for the city of Longmont. We currently have 31 members as of, oh, sorry, that should say June 30th of 2022, with new members in the second quarter of this year, including Cimarron Hospitality, who is the owner of the Hilton Garden Inn, as well as Bank of Colorado, Front Range Community College, and AGC Biologics. That group has funded two projects in 2022 so far, including the ongoing funding of Prosper Longmont through June of 2022, as well as providing, as I mentioned before, the funding for the diversity, equity, and inclusion workshops for our advanced Longmont 2.0 working groups. I'll remind you that the funding through the Aspire Leadership Council is entirely private sector funding contributed by the members of that leadership council. And so none of those are dollars, city dollars that are being used for that work. And so again, uh, with all of that, we anticipate meeting all of our objectives for 2022 or on track to do so, so far this year. And then I'll just give you some highlights of our overall economic position as a community. 
The city of Longmont in 2021 had about a $6.8 billion local economy. The region, so the immediate Longmont region, so the city of Longmont and immediately surrounding areas had just over or just under 56,000 jobs and had experienced a 3.8% employment growth rate over the previous five years. That includes the losses that were a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and our response to it. As of now, we're projecting that will end 2022 with nearly 57,000 jobs, which would represent 2.3% year over year job growth. So 3.8% in five years, 2.3% in one year. And we are back at a 2.8% unemployment rate as of April of this year. We also are paying close attention to uh, economic indicators related to residential real estate. And thanks to our partners at Bolo, Boulder Longmont Realtors, we know that the median sales price in Longmont in May was $628,000, which, as I think I mentioned last time, still uh, makes us the most affordable city in Boulder County from a residential home price perspective. We also continue to be the most active from a sales perspective, although the city of Boulder has a more significant inventory, had a more significant inventory as of May of this year in terms of homes available for sale or listed. This last slide, our commercial real estate indicators, you'll see uh, it notes that it's Q1 2022. We're doing this report much earlier in the month, this month than we normally would. So we don't have access to Q2 2022 commercial real estate data yet. Uh, so this remains the same. We'll be happy to share that Q2 information with you as soon as we have it later this month. And with that, I will answer any questions that you have for me. Councilor Waters. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, remind us of what your total budget for for an operating year for LEDP. Mayor Peck, Council Member Waters, uh, our budget this year is just shy of eight hundred thousand. It's seven hundred and eighty thousand. And of that, how much? There's you have a contract with the city. We do. What's the What's the amount in that contract? Three hundred and sixty-two thousand of the seven eighty. Correct. So forty percent, forty-ish percent. So you've leveraged yes. that three eighty-three uh, into almost eight hundred thousand dollars. Three sixty-two to yes. Which is, and um, uh, where were you prior to the pandemic? Is if you recovered fully from the pandemic? Because I know there was a a big impact. Yes, we were. We are projecting to recover more than recover. We've already in twenty twenty-two um, through June thirtieth. From, the pri from private sector funding, we've already raised more than we had raised in all of 2019 pre-pandemic. So, so you've come we've, back. Yes, we've definitely more than recovered. Um, and just as we are in the process of building our own budgets, as you're in the process of building yours, obviously everything, it's a very, it's a very positive report. Um, uh, and you've identified at least one of the headwinds, right, that you're looking at, and that's yep. housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are the what are the others that we ought to be aware of that you're facing and that, that likely others and other uh, the city and other businesses may face? Number one, and are there tailwinds that we ought to be taking advantage of? Uh, so, uh, to answer the first question, Councilmember Waters, um, in addition to housing, certainly ta the talent piece as a whole, housing isn't the only component. Of talent, um, child care. Our, yeah, <laughs> childcare, um, our inability to manufacture people at this point in time, um, all affect. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all affect our uh, primary industry base's ability to continue to um, operate here, grow here, invest here, expand here. So it's all interconnected. Transportation included, because as we don't have the talent that's needed here in Longmont, the ability to get them from other parts of the region into our community also becomes an issue. So all of the things that go into our ability to maintain a talent pipeline that um, that meets the needs of not just our existing primary industry base, but uh, as they grow and as new entrants come into the market. Uh, we are fortunate to have with St. Green Valley School District and Front Range Community College a couple of institutions that are absolutely contributing to future talent pipeline development, uh, but it's just not enough um, based on where we're at today from an industry perspective. Um, also, the our 
tr lack of available land, I shouldn't say lack, but our dwindling availability of land for commercial real estate development. Uh, I think that there is going to come a time in the very near future where redevelopment of uh, existing the existing built environment for industrial and manufacturing type businesses is going to have to be a uh, consideration and hopefully we'll be able to attract some investment to that. You've probably seen at the Max Store facility, the former Max Store facility, the Max, that there's some speculative investment going into improvements to that facility. We need to see a lot more of that in order for those facilities in in kind of that old portfolio uh, to be viable options for the companies that we're talking today as we don't have a lot of land to develop new facilities for, for new companies and for growing companies. It is uh, incredibly challenging to have to tell a company that was founded here, has grown here, has invested in our community, has created jobs in our community since the day that they were founded, that we have no longer any place for them to grow into. Uh, so those are the challenges I think that we face. Um, we, you know, we actually just talked to a developer today. Every investor, developer, uh, uh, site selection consultant, C-suite uh, individual that we talk to is uh, gung ho on Longmont. So there's two sides of that coin, right? We're very, very popular right now um, in terms of people's interest in being part of and investing in our community and being part of the future growth of our community. And so I think as long as we can continue to work together to address some of the challenges that we face, that we have a long, um, uh, many years of being able to continue to support our community through growth of our primary industry base. Thanks. Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tim Rodriguez. Uh, th thank you, Mayor Peck. So I just kind of <clears throat> spurred a question when I saw uh, your breakdown on the commercially available property uh, office versus indus industry, right? And uh, so as we know, in a lot of major metropolitan areas, we're seeing a lot of office buildings stay somewhat vacant due to remote work and how popular that is nowadays. Um, and I remember when I was first came on the council, there was a lot of conversation about how we didn't have enough Class A office space. Uh, are we starting to see that desire for Class A office space as potential development decrease considering remote work and, and kind of the changing uh, environment around how, how folks are doing their jobs these days? Sure. Thank you, Mayor Peck, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, so I was probably one of those people that was many years ago saying that uh, we needed some Class A office space and time, but it's actually been of benefit to us under current circumstances uh, because we didn't have a lot to lose. Uh, we didn't have a lot to lose. So, uh, And we certainly have not seen that, as I mentioned, over half of the activity in our pipeline is in that smart manufacturing space. Another 20, 25% of that is in our knowledge creation and deployment space, which lends itself to, that's really kind of R&D, which lends itself to more flex, what I would consider flex office or industrial space, so not multi-story, class A type of office environment. And uh, so, so we're really not seeing that demand for traditional, or what I think most people outside of Longmont would consider class A office space. And in fact, we're seeing our neighboring communities that have that product uh, struggling to backfill those spaces and also having concerns about as those leases run up, what's going to happen to them as companies start to uh, shrink their footprint as a result of work from home policies. So I guess, you know, that's kind of what I was expecting to hear. Uh, so has there been conversations about the adaptive reuse of our current office space, uh, you know, that's available within the city as far as, you know, looking forward to the possible shrinking of the footprints, as you just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, because that provides us opportunities to do some different things with those, those buildings or those sites uh, that, you know, would not have been the topic of conversation just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, so when we're talking about, thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, uh, when we're talking about office space, so uh, the data source that we use and most real estate data sources are looking at um, kind of the more traditional office space and flex office space generally falls into that industrial category. And I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. I will provide them to you if you're interested, but a significant portion of what is classified as office space in the city of Longmont is medical office space. Mm. So that space is full. That space is being used. As you know, UC Health built um, a, a whole additional uh, medical office space building. So our 
uh, not just class A office space, but our inventory of what would be considered pure office space as it relates to this numbers, these numbers is almost n negligible. Um, where we would like to see that kind of adaptive reuse redevelopment is in, uh, again, that kind of old prep portfolio stuff, which would actually be counted in the industrial numbers because it's considered as flex industrial space and so would not be considered in this off in in these office numbers. But yes, we would absolutely like to see redevelopment, adaptive reuse of many of those spaces that sit vacant and will continue to sit vacant because regardless of pandemic or work from home or anything else, they, they just don't meet the needs of industry today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. It's a really good report. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. So now we're at uh, public invited to be heard. Um, so the first person on the list is Polly Christensen. You have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Hello, Mayor Peck, uh, council members, and beloved former colleagues. Um, uh, I came to talk about um, item 12B, which, what? Oh, okay, okay. Um, I, by the way, 410 Judson Street. <laughs> Um, I came to talk about item 12B, which is under general business, and it's the campaign, the um, amendments to the Longmont uh, Fair Campaign Practice Act. Um, so uh, what I looked for in the um, printout to the um, description of the amendment was the word transparency, and I didn't really see it, but the entire... Uh, point of the Longmont Campaign Act was to make Longmont's elections more fair and less corrupt through transparency. All of these three suggestions uh, do that, and I would urge you to pass them. They're simple, and they are um, uh, they're very well thought out um, suggestions. The first one is simply a clarification of the fact that uh, address is... Uh, uh, I could, I could, an email address tells people nothing. I could register as mini 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 mouse uh, at gmail dot com, and it would tell people nothing about who I am. Um, so these are problems that that are addressed in these issues, um, and they uh, they've been going on for a number of years. It's not really a recent problem. Um, those who want their political donors to be secret and preserve privacy are really in the wrong business. Um, these three suggestions also bring the city of Longmont into alignment with the state campaign uh, practices rules. And in the case of Fort Collins LLC rules, they've also been tested in court. So I urge you to pass these. Thank you very much. Thank you, Polly. Uh, Strider Binston. I do. Uh, Strider Benston, 951 17th Avenue. I didn't realize Polly was going to bring up the election, Longmont. I was on the election commission in 09, and it's very interesting what we were finding. The people who took office uh, under illegal out of state money then. First uh, time they had a session, they abolished the election committee and disappeared, so we never made a final report. So uh, all of that is still going on. Uh, our currently illegally constituted Supreme Court is now making its own laws irrespective of precedent, authority, or constitutionality. Uh, abolishing women's rights, trying to abolish the right to vote, and empowering guns over people. And um, uh, the former guy who calls himself Mr. President um, called up to threaten a witness for the investigation next week. 
Uh, we'll see what comes out with that. The Supreme Court already uh, uh, passed uh, a judgment empowering rapists and incest people over women or, or girl children. And what I've mentioned before, um, one time you have a massacre, you create fear, you sell guns. Two times you have a massacre, you get more fear, you sell more guns. Three times you sell more guns, and then you have a Supreme Court that abolishes any right to restrict guns, and um, you create basically a civil war. That is what almost happened when the, when the, the mob attacked the Capitol in Washington they most, most of them didn't have their rifles with them. Why? Because Washington, D.C. had a policy, you cannot carry machine guns in the city, and they were going to confiscate them, so a lot of them didn't bring their guns. They had them stowed right across the river to bring them in once they took over the Capitol. That would have created a civil war, a race war, with possibly by now, millions dead. That is the policy of the people who are pushing that line. Let us not fall asleep. And um, uh, one new law that the Supreme Court is passing, let's cripple the Environmental Protection Association, which was started by Richard Nixon. Um, and now they would call him a communist because we want to save the planet. And they're saying, no, you cannot have any consideration. Give it all to the corporations. Thank you. Thank you, Strider. And now, Brian Johnston. Hi, I'm Brian Johnston at 926 Kaufman Street. And, um, you know, issues are often brought before the council to which the council has no authority to do anything about. Um, at least as a legislative body. Um, you know, it's kind of due to doctrine of preemption as part of the supremacy clause, clause where state preempts local and federal preempts state. Sometimes you'll issue statements or send a letter in support of something to someone, and this is one such request. I'm asking that city council stand with the women of our community whose privacy and health rights were just taken, and I'm asked that you send an official letter to the Colorado Bar Association asking them to address that their current member, Justice Neil Gorsuch, who is a resident of Boulder, Colorado, and licensed, under, by, licensed by the Colorado Bar, and ask them to address the fact that he lied under oath during his confirmation hearing. Now, I'm asking that you ask them, that you request that they stand up for the ethics that they purport to in their code of conduct. It won't change the decision. It, um, but it might get other municipalities on board. It won't, it, 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 then ultimately it might, at least at some level, hold him ac accountable for his perjury. <coughs> Any council member that doesn't want to sign on to it, fine. But um, I just think it would be supportive of the women in our community and um, and I think it would be the right thing to do to stand up for the ethics and values that that we should be standing up for and that it's not okay, even if you're a Supreme Court judge, to lie under oath. And so I hope you guys will consider this and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. So uh, before we have the consent agenda, we, the counselors have been here since 5.30. I would like to take a five minute break if you wouldn't mind.
Uh, do we have any other presentations? I think we're ready for the uh, consent agenda. So, John, would you mind reading uh, the consent agenda into the record? Absolutely, Absolutely Mayor. Item 9A is Resolution 2022-110, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the Boulder County Hazard Mitigation Plan for 2022 through 2027. 9B is Resolution 2022-111, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the Colorado Department of Transportation for grant funding for high visibility impaired driving enforcement. 9C is resolution 2022-112, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the amendment of the am amended and restated special council contract between the city and Kaplan Kirshen Rockwell LLP to expand the scope of work to include environmental and regulatory compliance special council services. And item 9D is approved two capital improvement program amendments. Thank you. Do any councilors want to pull items off of the agenda? I don't see Councillor Martin on items. Okay, seeing no, uh, no one that wants to pull anything off of the agenda, can I have a motion to move this agenda? Move the consent agenda. Thank you. And I'll second that. So the consent agenda has been moved by Councilor Waters and seconded by myself. Let's vote. All those in favor, let's vote. Vote yay. <laughs> Councilor Martin, are you there? There she is. So we just moved. Yes, having a few technical difficulties. Hang on. Okay. We can just, uh, we voted for on the consent agenda. If you just want to tell us your verbal vote. She yeah. did. Yeah. Well, that passes unanimously. Thank you. So we're down to the uh, ordinances on second reading and public hearings on any matter. The first one is 2022-25 a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations <coughs> for expenses and liabilities of the city of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2022. Uh, do we have a staff report? Okay, great. Good evening, um, Mayor, City Council. I'm Teresa Malloy, Budget Manager. And since this appropriation is um, quite large, we thought we'd take just a few minutes and give you um, some details on it. Um, so the city's, char the city's charter requires that an 
that annual unspent appropriations lapse at the end of the year for all funds except our public improvement fund. In addition, the city's purchasing code requires that projects are fully appropriated prior to awarding a contract or a bid. So what that means to us operationally is that any appropriation that was included in a prior year's budget that was budgeted for a very specific purpose or a project but not yet completed in that year will need to be carried over. So um, the 2021 capital improvement program included $84.7 million in budgeted uh, funding for a variety of projects. That combi combined with $212.6 million in carryover from 2020 resulted in a rather large unspent balance remaining from 2021. That needs to be carried over for the specific purposes for which it was budgeted. So this appropriation is, um, has really two components. One, $184.9 million of carryover funding. Most of this is for CIP projects that are continuing into 2022 and possibly beyond. There are some um, two very significant projects that I wanted to bring to your attention. So WTR 189, which is the Nelson Flanders Water Treatment Plant expansion. In this carryover appropriation, there is $43.4 million in the water fund and 12.1 million in the water construction fund. And then the second um, pretty significant project is WTR 183, which is the Price Park water tank, Price Park tank replacement. And that one is $24.3 million in the water fund and 6.3 million in the water construction fund. So those are the two most significant projects that make up the, the bulk of the carryover. However, we do have other funds that have pretty significant carryover projects, and they include the electric utility for advanced metering, the sewer fund for wastewater treatment plant master plan improvements, the storm drainage fund for resilient St. Vrain project, the street fund for Boston Avenue Bridge over the St. Vrain River, the open space fund for open space acquisitions, the fleet fund for vehicles that were budgeted in 21, but due to supply issues were not received and there could, therefore could not have been booked as an expense in 21. And then finally, the utility billing CIS fund for the replacement of the ongoing utility billing software system. So the second type of appropriation included in this um, ordinance this evening is um, what, what we typically bring to you um, outside of this big carryover. So it's the typical things that you see from us um, pretty much every month, and that is um, $3.4 million. So things like grants, additional uh, um, revenues that, that were received but not budgeted. Um, and so with that, I do have um, a few staff members behind me this evening in case you have any projects on anything specific. I don't see anyone with uh, questions on this. I do, I do have one, Teresa, and it's probably, this is, this is a, uh, this is a good report. I'm, I'm thankful that you did it. But I'm curious, is there a place on the website that we can look at all of the projects and the dollars amount that were asked for in the budgeting process and where they are on that project? Oh, and where they are on that project. I, uh, I guess I'm curious as to uh, if, if the budget, and I, I ran this past Becky Doyle, just this thought <laughs> process, <laughs> Um, if we, if they asked for, let's say, $2 million to, for a specific project and the timeline would be two years, three years that it would be provided, but it's gone into four and five years, 
how do we know where they are in that pro I'm curious is where are they in that project uh, whether it's street whether it's uh, maintenance building I can jump in on that one. okay so um, that was actually part of our conversations during budget reviews um, and one of the things that we're looking at is um, so we don't have a unified project management approach um, so people are managing their projects in different ways you know some use Microsoft projects some are using Smartsheet depending on the scope of it and so what we're actually talking about right now um, and you may see this in the budget is how do we we really take a more unified approach in project management specifically uh, project management software that can create dashboards and in terms of what we're doing some places do have dashboards but we need to bring it together as a city and, and part of the reason why I want to see the dashboard is so I can look at where are we on this project here's what the you know you budget it you're supposed to start it at this point in time right are we on pace with what we're supposed to be and um, Becky and I are actually we had those conversations today about what is that going to look like but um, you will definitely see that in the budget process because um, we need to be able to move from a dashboard for the um, you know the project manager to the director to the ACMs to myself and then how we can share that with you to say here is the status of the projects and here's what we're doing oh that would be great Harold um, I understand that this is operations right. and it, we really don't have anything authority over that um, but it, it would be nice to know when asked well even just for my own mm -hmm. sake we see this project going on and it's been in process for five years when are we going to see uh, what, what's the holdup is it going to be finished is it and, and part of it is uh, the St. Vrain bikeway. Mm -hmm. you know, I've had a lot of questions about that. And I don't really know where we are in that process. Is that I, I do know that a lot of it had to do with RSVP. Correct. It, yeah. And that's part of what, I mean, you all budget, the, you approve the budget and the expenditure of these funds. And that's kind of why I want to look at this concept and where we're moving because I think it is important for you all to see it mm -hmm. and, and see where we are um, on these projects. Um, just to answer, you know, where we are on the St. Brain is we're moving into the Boston Avenue Street Project. I'm kind of looking back at Becky. So that's going to start in, is it this year or next so. year? So we hope to start this year. Jim's there. The other piece of that project is the work that's going to be done by the Army Corps of Engineers on the Isaac Walton piece that, that's coming into this. And so, you know, those are the pieces that are, are now coming forward in that. Did I miss anything, Jim? <laughs> and the other thing that's going to be important in completing RSVP is is the, the bond election that we're looking at this year. Okay. Right. Um, and, and being able to complete that. Once the recovery pieces, the, the RSVP pieces of the St. Brain Greenway are completed, we have future phases of the phase 12 and phase 13, one going east and one going west, and I keep losing track of which one goes which direction. Um, and those are the, sort of the next up pieces uh, related to the Greenway. Okay. Thank you for that. That was a question okay. I, I had. You're good, Jim. Okay. You're good. I can give you an update. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, are there any other are there any other questions by council? No. Uh, is there any? Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> I forgot to. Think. Is there anybody from the public that would like to uh, speak on, on this ordinance? Seeing none, can I have a motion to move ordinance? What? I move ordinance 2022-25. I'll second. Okay, move by. Move by adoption. Rodriguez. Or can I, I can't hear. Oh. Um, so we were wondering if do you have any I asked if there was any comments from council or from the public on ordinance 2022-25 and then asked for a motion to move this ordinance. So the ordinance was a motion. We did. It was moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, seconded by uh, Councillor um, was, was yeah. Hidalgo Faring. <laughs> and now we're going to vote on it.
So that motion carried unanimously. The second ordinance on second reading is 2022-26, a bill for an ordinance amending section 3.04.885 of the Longmont Municipal Code, adopting an amended and restated City of Longmont General Employees Retirement Plan. Do we have a staff report on this? Uh, no, Mayor, but uh, Jim is here to answer questions. Okay. Do we have any, uh, do we have any comments from the public? Would the public like to speak on this ordinance? Seeing none. Are there any questions or comments from council? Seeing none, uh, we need to uh, admit, uh, would someone like to move this ordinance? I'll move ordinance 2022-26. All right, it's been moved by Councilor Waters, seconded by Council Councilor Yarbrough, let's vote. And that passes unanimously. So we didn't have any items moved from the consent agenda, the consent agenda, so we'll move on to general business. Uh, we need to recess as the Longmont City Council and convene as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1. We have a motion. All right. All right, it's been moved by Councillor Waters to uh, convene as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1 and seconded by Councillor Yarbrough. Let's vote. And that passes unanimously. So um, we have a resolution of RLGID 2022-02. It's a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1 enacting a supplemental budget and making an additional appropriations for the expenses and liabilities of the district for the fiscal year beginning January 1st, 2022. Do we have any uh, presentation on this? Or anyone want to speak to this? Resolution seeing none. Do we have any questions or comments from the council? So I will move our LGID 2022-02. I'll move this resolution. It's, it's been seconded by Councillor Waters. Let's vote. And that passes unanimously. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. So it's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez to adjourn as the Board of Directors of the Longmont General Improvement District Number 1 and reconvene as the, the Longmont City Council. It's been seconded by Councillor uh, Hidalgo Faring. Let's vote. That carries unanimously. The second thing under general business is an amendment to the Longmont Fair Campaign Practices Act. Do we have a presentation on this? There's Don. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I did not uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, um, but before you tonight is uh, some possible amendments to Longmont Fair Campaign Practices Act. Uh, you all directed us to add the word street in, in section 204-207-A. We have provided a red line showing where that wording would be added. That would clarify that uh, in contribution and expenditure reports, street address would absolutely be required um, without a doubt. So that is uh, one suggested amendment. The other two were um, the direction you all gave us was for my office to bring back any suggestions we had. We had two. Uh, one was to add ballot measures in under electioneering um, and independent expenditure reporting requirements. And you can see those changes in the red line as we proposed. And the other was to um, just amend slightly how the violations work. Instead of first requiring um, our office to issue a notice of violation to allow us to have the conversation, give someone the chance to cure it if they don't or can't, then proceed with a notice of violation. So just reversing that, um, it actually makes the flow better and the va vast majority of complaints that we've seen are fixed within seven days. So by and large, the largest issue is someone forgot to file a report and 
they get them in with seven day, within seven days. And then lastly, um, we were approached uh, by uh, some residents suggesting changes around uh, LLC reporting requirements. We did not draft those in the red line for you because that was, uh, we don't have that direction from council necessarily, but while we had the hood open, so to speak, on this part of our uh, municipal code engine, uh, we wanted to toss that question to you and ask if you, while we are making changes in this section of code, is that something council would like to see moving forward? So Tim Hole, assistant city attorney, was kind enough to do a little bit of research around um, the LLCs, uh, how the statute regulates LLCs, and found that the we kind of concurred that the wording that Fort Collins has, it accomplishes the same thing as the statute, but it's just a lot easier to read than statute. So that's why we provided that wording in the council communication so you can see what that might look like. So we're really looking for direction about which um, of these items you would like us to bring back for um, changes in the code. So we bring back an ordinance for first and second reading. Okay, do we have any communication on this? Uh, questions, concerns from counselors? Do we, uh, Councilor Waters? Thanks, Mayor Pack. Um, should I assume, I'm going to assume, based on the earlier conversation, that the reason for adding the address, and I, I assume somebody could provide sufficient guidance to candidates to make certain the PayPal account is opened in a way or, or created in a way that they could get to an address. Because I've had the experience of having a very difficult time doing that. But the interest, the, the purpose of that is really accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? I, I think other, in, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. So, and, I, and I'm down with that, that's fine. But, but it does raise a question for me. When we get to a paragraph that talks about a small group of residents, uh, I asked Don for the names of residents. She had one. I don't know how many there are. It strikes me as ironic that one provision in the interest of accountability that we add, and, and then another section where a small group of residents unnamed, and we're going to spend time on, on a, a potential legislation that we didn't ask for, that a, an un, unnamed group of residents came to somebody and got on a council agenda. Mm -hmm. It's in my four and a half or so years on the council, I don't recall that ever happening before. Um, can I just interrupt for a minute? Don did call and ask if, uh, if I thought it would be a good idea or if I wanted to throw this in on. Then I'll direct discussion. my comments to you. I don't recall this ever happening before. Maybe and not. if a group of, so here's a question for you. If a group of developers rewrote our code or, or wanted to see the code rewritten on land use or building codes, or a group of gun enthusiasts wanted to rewrite our legislation on, or, or proposed legislation on gun regulations or deregulation, or Prosper Longmont, who we do have names of, would that just show up on the council agenda without any conversation ahead of time, without direction from the council? It possibly could if it's a subject that we are going to be discussing anyway. This is just a discussion uh, whether whether we wanted on to be part of the codes, we wanted to rewrite the codes or not. It's, a, it's kind of up to us, or we can just throw it out and say, let's bring this back on another agenda. So this is an invitation to groups to to without request, groups to rewrite or propose language or bring in the ordinances of other communities to Longmont for our consideration without any discussion at this level. That's a good okay. point. And let me just ask the question. Since that's inconsistent with our charter, I wonder how we get here. Because the charter stipulates under ordinances, section 4.8, we're not following it anyway, that the council shall establish a committee on ordinance revision consisting of the city attorney, the municipal judge, and other uh, and other member appointed by the council. It goes on from there. I mean, we, that, we, this sound seems to be consistent with the charter. What we're doing right now. Okay, good point. So, are we gonna are we gonna take this seriously, and the way this ca came to us? So, um, it's a good point. Uh, can I hear from the other counselors as well as what? What do you think about? Should we take this out? Would you? What is it you would you would like to do? Continue with this discussion or take this out of our discussion tonight? 
the Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Are you referring to the LLC or the street no, I, address or the whole? It's not the whole thing. No, what, he, what it we're referring to is the amendment proposed by residents to regulate contributions by LLCs. So, um, I mean, I'm not ready to, to adopt any language. I approve of the three items that were listed on there and okay. redlined. Um, so my question is, uh, Councillor Hidalgo Faring, is do you want us to just take this out of this discussion tonight, the amendments proposed by the LLCs? Well, I wanted to, to hear a discussion first, kind of, and, and, you, and you had spoke to it a little bit. Um, but the question is, according to Councillor Waters, it is mm -hmm. not in the charter, and I did not follow the charter. So with that in mind, do you want us to leave it in or take it out of tonight's discussion so well let's go ahead and take I I mean I would move to take it out okay of today's discussion and then let's look per our charter to to have to a discuss further to discuss that later but then does that mean that we remove all three items no, I'm, no, my, no okay. I'm, sorry, I'm not even not. speaking to okay. the substance at this point oh, no I right. might because uh, yeah. I don't understand some of it but my concern with just the just the it's process fine. It's okay. fine. I took okay. it. I took your remarks seriously. Thank you, uh, Councillor Yarbrough. Thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, I, if this is not what we're used to, if this is not consistent with, you know, adding in uh, a subject matter to discuss, I think that we probably should bring it back okay. to discuss it. Um, Thank you. That's my opinion. But of course, you know, if this is the first time. Um, that this is unusual for council, then I think we should. Okay. Thanks. And and I do, um, you know, staff brought it to me, so I think both of us kind of jumped and decided we needed to discuss this. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just my, it was brought to me by staff. Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I think, you know, things that, are on top of mind for a lot of folks in the way our governance works right now is not upending precedent. Um, and so setting a new precedent tonight, that could be a, open up a slippery slope uh, as Council Member Waters named some examples of how this could come back and bite us. I think we should follow uh, our standard rules and, uh, and procedures and how we introduce items to the agenda. And Tim, I guess you have no... <laughs> No reason for for her to be here because of that LLC. I, I mean, did, I did draft the other parts. So mm -hmm. I, can, I, well, can I love the way you drafted it, by the way. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Uh, we will remove that third part, and then we will be taking discussion on the first three items that we Perfect. brought up. Thank you, Mayor. So, do we have any um, council, Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, thank you, Mayor Peck. Um, I have no problem with the addition of street address to it. Um, is it a consideration that candidates will have to take into account in the coming uh, elections? Yes, uh, but I think it does help provide that transparency that we heard spoken about by a member of the public, as well as, uh, you know, not so much in maybe the, the most recent elections, but there has been occasions uh, in the fairly uh, recent past where there was a lot of out-of-state money that was coming into city elections, specifically during the oil and gas kind of uh, issues that came up uh, during the fracking ban. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with that red line change, nor do I think that the suggestions from the city clerk's office, uh, I think they stand uh, up to scrutiny. So I would move that we approve all of those changes as uh, written in the red line version. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Okay. Is, do I have a motion then to uh, accept those? You moved it. Second? I second. It's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem uh, to accept the three options that were laid out to us by council to amend the uh, Fair Campaign P Practice Act, and it has been seconded by Councillor Hidalgo Ferry. Uh, let's vote. If you don't mind voting. Oh, oh I'm Go sorry. <laughs> uh, Councillor Waters. 
just to be clear, we are we're considering this then a first reading tonight? Is no. That, we would bring the, it back for first reading. Okay, so this is the to direction to bring it back as Correct. first reading. Thank Correct. you. Are you good with that? Okay, great. If you could vote by hand, since I'm here and not there. Please, oh. thank you. <laughs> I thought you were magic. <laughs> All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? So that passes unanimously uh, with Councillor Martin. And Councillor um, Martin was in favor, correct? Yes. yes. Yes, okay. Councillor Martin, I'm sorry, I, I should have spoke closer to the microphone. Did you hear all of that discussion? I heard very little of the discussion. As the meeting has gone on, everybody's been getting farther away from their mics. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Well, Just maybe I can call you tomorrow right and let you know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Very good, Mayor and Council. So we will uh, put those into ordinance format, get them on the next agenda for first reading. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have a uh, final call public be invited to be heard. Uh, Paul Tiger, uh, where am I? 350 Kimbark? Anywhere that isn't my house. Um, I uh, actually wanted to uh, thank you for uh, um, adding a street to uh, uh, address. Uh, I'd like to say that the, uh, the uh, this is really kind of to Tim. Uh, uh, the, uh, there are 10 people on this committee. There are two former council members. Uh, uh, city uh, manager, uh, you've uh, received uh, emails from people. You've talked to them. Um, this uh, piece of um, the wording here for uh, LLC limitation comes from state law. It isn't something that was uh, invented by um, a, a developer or uh, someone in their basement. Um, it, it is follow state law. Uh, the wording for uh, Fort Collins was easier to understand. Um, and um, no, you didn't bring it forward, but um, I was uh, thankful that uh, it was uh, proposed. Um, I hope that uh, at some point in, in the future, uh, people here on the council will take a look at this code. It's very simple to understand. Um, we've had uh, many problems. Uh, in the 10 years that I've been involved with it, with uh, uh, LLCs uh, and 501c4s, which is, uh, you know, uh, state PACs. Um, uh, funding, uh, um, you know, opposition. Uh, I think that um, uh, in a few years, we'll probably look to that larger code because we are a large city now mm -hmm. and we have a lot of interesting um, problems like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Mayor and Council comments. Do we have any comments from Councilors? Councilor Waters. Um, once upon a time, in the, in the last year, um, uh, we gave direction to staff that any residential, any residential project that had, had we were a developer had applied or was in the entitlement process. It was in the queue for up to a year that would come to the council for review. We, we haven't reviewed any in that, in that time frame um, that have been in the queue for a year. I'm just curious, have we, have there been, if, are there none that have been in the queue for a year or more that would have been subject to that direction? Mayor Peck, <clears throat> Council Member Waters. Um, currently, Glenn is pulling the data and I believe is going to send an info item to Council with that update. Um, and there may be one that has been back and forth in the queue a few times, so we're hoping to get that to you in the, by the end of this month. That would be helpful. I just, it's, we, you know, we had that conversation and we've never come back to it. And I just for in the interest of accountability, you know, I, just to make certain we, we're closing that loop. Kind of a related question. I, I, I read a, a paragraph from the Charter. <laughs> tonight. I don't even know if it's right. We're not doing it, right? We're not, we haven't appointed a, and I'm not being critical of that. We just haven't done it. And I, I'm sorry, what Well, the, exactly? the, the creation, the appointment of an of a ordinance revision committee. Oh. 
Okay. That includes the city attorney, the municipal judge, which would be a curiosity, and then one other person. Uh, it's like we've, just as we haven't had things like came to, we haven't followed that one in the whole four years I've been on the council either. And it just begs the question, have we ever, the council was, or the charter was adopted in 1961. It's been amended a dozen times since then. Has there ever been a citizen review of the charter? Uh, any of those amendments are a result of a citizen review or they're the kind of one-off things that one of us or, or, or you know, when things become a problem and... Uh, <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to uh, interrupt just for a minute because this is a conversation that we had early on is that we need to look at this charter. So um, I'm on board with it. <laughs> yeah. I just think, I think it'd be good if, if we had a citizen review. That, so that, that's the comment. Or at least, I'm sorry. At least a citizen on the review committee, citizens, not totally. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, when we when we looked at some of the charter amendments, we were more focused on. When we looked at the uh, charter on the adjustments regarding the election, um, obviously we have a lot of things that even we see in there that you know, we kind of scratch our head. And, and similar to your point, I've been here for 10, when I got here 10 years ago, I don't think there was a ordinance revision committee. I don't know if we've ever had one. And and so it probably w would be good to look at some of these issues, um, especially as, you know, we see issues that are in our charter that aren't necessary, necessarily in conformance with, with state law and other things. And so we've tossed that around. Um, I know we were really pushing aggressively in terms of the election component simply because we saw what that did and we didn't want that to occur. But, um, yeah, so I don't think any of us are aware of one. Mm -hmm. Councillor Martin, I see your hand up. Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, uh, I am the person who introduced the motion uh, that I think was the subject of Dr. Waters first question, which is at since that motion was adopted, have there been any development projects that included housing that uh, have been have have elapsed longer than one year from application to approval that are that are still awaiting approval dr waters i can't hear a word you say so would you please <laughs> nod if that was if that was your uh the gist of your question so Councilor martin can i just jump in here um i can't understand you either at this point mayor peck <laughs> well i don't know what to tell you <laughs> go ahead Councilor martin get in that microphone and tell her what she wants to know. <coughs> Councilor Waters. Can you hear me now? And, uh, sort of. <laughs> I did raise, yes, I raised that question. I, I'm swallowing this microphone now. And, and Marcia, no one here wants to hear what I had to say, I don't think. So just get in line for, for that. Uh, wait, 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 I, I, I still, I, I don't know the answer. Yes or no? Was that the subject of your yes, first question? Yes. And are there any? Because we're going to get a report. Anything. What? You're, you're going to get a report. When? It's in the process now. Glenn Van Nimwegen is putting it together now. Uh, Assistant City Manager Joni Marsh said that she thinks there is one that we will be brought to us. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to know because I couldn't hear it. I think they could have heard me at the Dickens. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> Mayor and Council, Eugene May, city attorney. I've been here since 2009. I, there has been no uh, ordinance uh, committee. We have done recodification, which, you know, I, it's a charter adopted in 61. I'm not sure what the difference is between the recodification and the ordinance review committee. Um, 
and we actually have recodification going on right now. Um, and so I, I do think a lot of those provisions age. I think with, in terms of recodification, we were, I've been in conversation with the city clerk's office. You know, we hire a service, MuniCode, to update our code, and it's online and is almost uh, current on newly passed ordinances. And so, you know, is that charter provision antiquated or outdated? Perhaps. Um, and the Ordinance Review Committee doesn't have that 10-year, you know, kind of hard timing. It's periodically... Um, and so we are in between periods, apparently. Thank you. I don't know what we do with that, except for maybe get a committee together and review. But we can we can discuss that and perhaps make a think about it, make a motion at the next meeting to direct staff on the way we want to go. I have actually seen this done in the community that I worked in prior to this. And um, there is different ways to approach it. So if you all want to do that, then we can, as staff, look into it and give you some options. That would be great. Thank you, Harold. So back to you, city manager. Do you have any remarks? No comments, Mayor Council. City Attorney Eugene? No comments, Mayor. Great. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's been moved by Councillor Waters, seconded by uh, Councillor Hidalgo Faring to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. All right. We are adjourned.